Welcome, Welcome to Own or Disown, where tech decisions are made easy. easy, 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 easy. Howdy, this is Chris from Own or Disown, and today we're going to be taking a look at the top spec MSI Stealth 17 Studio. I've had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with the device that you see on your screen here, which is currently showcasing a brushed black skin from M2 Skins, and I'm excited to share my experiences with you. Of course, we have a plethora of benchmarks to cover as well, and I think you'll find that this laptop lives up to its name by the end of the video. But first, let's take a look at the specs of our review unit. Being the top model, our device is kitted out with an Intel Core i9-13900H that has a max TDP of 135 watts. For a GPU, we've got the NVIDIA RTX 4090 that has a max TDP of 105 watts. For memory, there's 64 gigs of DDR5-5600 in a 2x32 configuration, and for storage, we've got a 2TB NVMe SSD. The screen is a 17.3-inch QHD IPS panel, and it runs at 240Hz. There's a full HD IR webcam, and being a studio device, it's great to see a full-size SD card slot. For the ports, we have one HDMI 2.1 port, a Thunderbolt 4 port, a USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 port with display port out, and a maximum allowed battery of 99.9 watt hours. All of this in roughly a 15 and a half inch by 11 inch chassis and it's less than one inch thick. It's a little bit on the hefty side weighing in at about six pounds. The MSRP is a penny under $4,000 and I can't believe I'm saying this to you but that positions it as one of the more economical i9-4090 combination devices. Let's take a closer look at the chassis but before we do, a word from today's video sponsor. And now a quick shout out to today's sponsor the FQQ S20 triple monitor. I've spent some time using the S20 and I want to share my thoughts with you. I travel a lot for work and one of the frustrations I have is screen real estate. Being stuck to a single screen can be quite limiting because I'm a multitasker at heart. Having the capability to multitask just makes the value I bring to my clients all the more efficient. Enter the S20. The S20 is a portable triple monitor solution that uses an intuitive folding design to add two high quality 15 inch 1080p IPS displays to your laptop's built in display. Each monitor is independently connected and configured for extra control, even dual sources. And the unique expanding brace and kickstand design holds the screens firmly to the monitor lid. So let's take a look at what you receive in the box the monitors, obviously, some documentation, a pair of screen protectors, a bag of brace pads for thinner laptop lids, a pair of right angle USB C cables a pair of HDMI to mini HDMI cables, and an external power supply, and a pair of USB-A to USB-C cables. The packaging is put together and ensures the monitor will make it safely to you. The displays have great color and the refresh is easy on the eyes, which comes in especially handily after a long day of work. You can even use it with just one extra display if you're short on space. Setup and breakdown are easy and will have you on the go in no time. It even comes with a nice soft carrying case to protect the monitors while in your bag. Overall, I'm pretty impressed with what the S20 brings to the table. Having a triple monitor setup that folds up nicely and fits into a backpack to carry around goes a long way to increasing my productivity while on the go. They even come in silver or black. Check them out on Amazon with the link below. Now back to the review. And we're back. The power brick, as you can see, is 240 watts and about the size of my hand. That's pretty transportable. The lid finish is black with a subtle sheen. It looks good, but is very prone to fingerprints. Luckily, there's skins for that. The Dragon logo is subtle, but noticeable on the lid. Moving on to the interior, you're greeted with a Steel Series keyboard that has full RGB and is a joy to use. Off to the right is a 10 key numpad with odd positioning of the directional buttons. Weirdly, this appears to be a 15 inch keyboard format in a 17 inch chassis. It's good to see a fingerprint reader on the palm rest, and two of the DIN audio speakers are flanking each side. We'll take a look at those in a bit. Let's close this for now and take a look at the ports. On the right side are two USB-Cs and a full-size SD card slot. Around the back we have a proprietary power port, HDMI 2.1 port, and a 2.5 gigabit LAN. Good to see these starting to trickle into laptops. On the left is two USB-A ports and a headphone jack. I'm happy to see these on the left since I'm right-handed. On the bottom is your normal stickering for the OS, model, and serial information, 
two more DIN audio woofers, and a very generous, sleek design for the fan vents. We'll see just how cool this device runs in a bit. Flipping back around, and you can already see just how many fingerprints we've accrued during this overview. The screen is vibrant and high resolution, not quite 4K, but definitely better than 1080p. Checking the wobble, it looks like there's a little bit of wobble on the screen while it's sitting on a desk. And of course, the lid can be opened with one finger if that's your thing. Let's take a listen to the speaker quality next. I'm not going to talk a lot in this section, but let's take a listen to the speakers through a couple of different music scenarios. So as you just heard, the speakers can get quite loud, with the sound meter peaking around 90 to 91 decibels. I didn't hear a lot of distortion, and we'll classify these as a higher-end speaker set for gaming laptops. You'll have no issues hearing sounds from games, music, or conference calls on this system. Well done, MSI. Moving on to fan noise, we're starting off with the stress load of Cinebench R23. These clips were taken a few runs into the benchmark, once the noise and heat had leveled off. The profile used for each test is listed in the respective box. Let's have a listen. The extreme performance and smart auto profiles are virtually identical in the noisiest of the bunch. Balanced is only slightly quieter and silent is truly living up to its name. It'll be interesting to see how much performance or thermal trade-off there is between them. So this is a synthetic scenario, but what about noise during gaming? And poof! I've instantly loaded and heat soaked the Tucson area of The Witcher 3 Complete Edition. Let's have a listen to this fan noise. Hmm, rather interesting results. Extreme Performance and Smart Auto have come down below the 60 decibel threshold to pretty much match the balance profile. Silent remains as quiet as it did during the synthetic stress load. Suffice it to say, silence is the most bearable to me if you're going to be stressing the system. But at what cost? Before we dive into the benchmarks and charts, let's take a quick look at the typing noise of the keyboard. The whole premise of the stealth is to fit in with gaming dens and boardrooms alike. Let's see how it sounds on the silent profile in a quiet room. Not that bad. I actually love the keyboards that MSI put into their laptops. Uh, the responsiveness and the typing experience is always great. I do wish they had more horizontal space to improve the 10 key and arrow key placement on this particular unit, but at least the arrow keys are full size. One last stop before the charts, the webcam and mic audio. And this is how the webcam looks and the microphone sounds. I left a little bit of my uh, scruff here to see if you could see any detail. And now, finally, benchmarks. 
Leading things off with our synthetic suite, Geekbench 5. As you can see, all the plugged-in profiles are within the margin of error, edging even the desktop AMD 7700X. The 13700H is not far behind, unsurprisingly. Unplugged battery mode takes a bit of a hit and barely edges the lower end i7 1360p. In the single core test, we see some interesting results. The 13700H and 1360p are now ahead of the 13900H and trailing the 7700X and the higher end 13900HX. A new addition to our test suite, Geekbench 6. In the multi-core test, the 13700H seems to wiggle its way in between our different profiles. Meanwhile, the 1360p is but a step between the unplugged MSI and the Smart Auto profile. In the single core test, all profiles slide below the comparisons, with battery mode following the pack. It's interesting to see this behavior on the Geekbench tests, especially since both 5 and 6 react so similarly. All right, on to Blender. In the monster test, we can see the MSI holding pace with a desktop 7700X. The 13700H is again a step between the plugged-in profiles and the Stealth 17 on battery. Unsurprisingly, ultra-low voltage and low-voltage parts trail behind. Next up is Handbrake. Again, a very good showing for the Stealth. Plugged-in profiles fit nicely between prior generation parts and unlocked higher power chips. This particular test was one of the least impacted by moving to battery. Good news for on-the-go Handbrake users. Ah yes, Time Spy. In the CPU test, we see plugged-in profiles clustered together in the middle of the chart, falling behind unlocked chips and thicker laptops, but ahead of the majority of our last-gen H-series chips. Battery power performance slides in above a 5800H and just behind a 12700H with an 85-watt profile. On the GPU side, the 4090 does well even at 105 watts. Plugged in, it matches the similarly slim Alienware M16 with a 175-watt 4080, but naturally fell behind thicker, full wattage A4080 laptops. Combining the two into the overall score, this laptop came just shy of the Electronics Mech 16 GP with a higher TDP CPU and GPU. As is much the trend, the battery performance falls behind even a Galaxy Book 3 Ultra with a little 4050. Our last synthetic test is Cinebench R23. On the multi-core test, we can see each of the profiles spread out a bit. Extreme and Balance clustered together between the MSI GE77HX with a 12800HX and an Alienware M16 with a 13900HX. Smart Auto fell behind the Alienware, but ahead of last year's Acer Helios 300. In the single core, we see similar behavior of that of Geekbench. The MSI slides down the chart behind the mostly higher TDP chips, aside from the 13700H and the Galaxy Book 3 Ultra. Smart Auto and Silent even came behind a 28 watt 1600U from last year. Battery power falls well behind the 5825U from even before then. Starting off with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, this laptop sandwiches pretty much the whole chart at 1080p. Some of Nvidia's and AMD's best from last gen fall behind all plugged in profiles, including Silent, but come ahead of the battery powered scenario. Even on battery power, the game is still very playable at 1080p Ultra. Shifting to a higher resolution, and we see the thicker, higher wattage laptops of the current gen pull ahead, but the stealth still tops last gen. Battery power is on the very edge of unplayable at 40 frames. Still, 91 to 98 FPS at 1440p is a very smooth experience. In Cyberpunk 2077, the stealth comes out ahead of higher power last gen chips. The 6800M from AMD does very well here at 1080p, and of course this generation higher power chips are slightly ahead of both. Moving up to 1440p and the story continues, last gen chips with much higher TDP are outclassed by the new stealth, with higher power current gen chips being slightly ahead. But what about ray tracing in the new DLSS 3? Well. At 1080p, we can see the frame generation working wonders in Cyberpunk. Not only do we get all those rays traced, but you'll notice the frame rates are even higher than their non-ray tracing results. Even battery power gets closer to 60 frames per second. Switching to 1440p and the story is identical. Frame generation improves frame rates over even non-ray traced results. A newcomer to our benchmark suite, Dead Space Remake. We don't yet have a ton of comparison data for this benchmark yet, so we're comparing ray tracing and DLSS versus native rendering. At 1080p, we can see DLSS working its magic once again and performing better than native rendering without ray tracing. This is also one of the better results for battery power. Silent puts up great results here, coming just behind extreme performance. The story remains much the same at 1440p as well. Take a look at the chart. Up next is Hitman 3. At 1080p, the native render without DLSS or ray tracing outperformed their counterparts. Battery power severely cuts performance here, but is still playable at 1080p. At 
1440p, the comparison remains much the same, but you'll notice performance in general only dips about 20 to 30 percent. 120 frames per second at 1440p is still a great result. In Horizon Zero Dawn, we see yet another instance where moving up in resolution doesn't impact performance very much. This time, the dip is only 10 to 20 percent. It's likely that there's some bottleneck going on at 1080p resolutions in these games. Moving on to Red Dead Redemption 2, we had to run this multiple times to confirm the results. The plugged in results look normal, with all profiles clustered within a couple frames of each other. The odd result here is just how well battery actually performed at 1080p. We checked the settings and reran the test multiple times and got similar results, so this is one of the few well performing titles on battery power. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, at 1080p, the stealth is again outclassing yesteryear's devices with higher power. Battery of course came in behind as usual, but is perfectly playable at 74fps. Moving up to 1440p and the story is much the same, we did layer in some results from early testing on this year's devices, and the higher power current gen devices do edge the stealth as expected. Rounding out our gaming suite, we end with The Witcher 3 Complete Edition. Both 1080p and 1440p are perfectly playable in the new Ultra Plus settings. We did also test some ray tracing in DLSS 3, but we're getting very inconsistent results and glitches, uh, likely driver related. So uh, we, we're not posting those figures here. Switching gears, we're going to take a look through some of the hardware info logs that we took uh, during our various Cinebench runs. Uh, just to see how the different profiles impact the system. Starting with Extreme, we see an initial surge to that 135 watt limit with an average clock speed of just under 4 GHz. Uh, that quickly ramps down and bounces between 90 and 105 watts to attempt to maintain what appears to be a temperature target of 95 degrees Celsius. Uh, average clock speeds uh, settle themselves around 3.6 GHz. On the balance profile, we can see the system lowering TDP and targets. Uh, this time we start around 115 watts and about 3.8 gigahertz. Uh, the temp target remains at around 95 degrees Celsius. Once settled, power jumps between 80 and 95 watts, about a 10 watt difference from extreme. Average clock speeds settle around 3.5 gigahertz, uh, about a 100 megahertz difference. With the smart auto profile, I'm not quite sure what it offers. Uh, power target temp target and clock speeds all seem to mirror the extreme profile in limitations, uh, but it jumps around a bit more, which I'm assuming is the system trying to adjust and be quote unquote smart. Not sure. Moving on to the silent profile, uh, the system appears to manage targets much more strictly here. Temperatures hover around a very cool 60 degrees Celsius. Clocks lock to about 2.15 gigahertz on average, and TDP is targeted at a solid 30 watts. Uh, this is astonishing given the relative performance to the other profiles, which we're going to cover shortly with some other graphs, but... Finally, we have the extreme profile, but running on battery power. Uh, TDP is capped at 15 watts for the CPU, uh, and this is where we see the 13900H struggle to maintain clocks with being so power starved. Uh, they try to target 2.15 GHz, similar to silent, but you'll see that some of the clocks often go well below 2 GHz to maintain that 15 watt target. Uh, the silver lining, however, is that temps are ice cold, at least by today's standards, uh, at 55 degrees Celsius. So let's take a look at each of the metrics across all of the scenarios. Starting with clock speeds, we see extreme, balanced, and smart auto profiles all following a very similar curve within 100 MHz usually. Meanwhile, silent and battery power only sit around the 2.15 GHz mark, with some obvious power starvation occurring on battery. The story is similar when we take a look at the CPU package power utilization. Extreme, Balanced, and Smart Auto are all clustered together. Uh, balance is averaging about 10 watts or so less, and Silent is capped at 30, while Battery is capped at 15 watts. Lastly, CPU package temperatures, to no surprise, uh, the Extreme, Balanced, and Smart Auto profiles all cap around 95 to 98 degrees Celsius. It's interesting to see balance hitting the same uh, temperatures, even having 10 watt less of a power target. Uh, the cooling system here might be uh, at its limit when it goes beyond 80 watts. 
Uh, meanwhile, Silent sits at the comfortable 60 to 62 degrees, and battery only mode sits at around 55 degrees. So how does this all stack up in relative performance between the profiles? Starting with our synthetic suite, the numbers here are, well, look for yourself. Uh, using the silent profile as a baseline and averaging all of the relative results, uh, the extreme and balanced are only, yes, that's right, 3% faster. Smart Auto is within the margin of error at 1%, and battery is about 21% slower than silent. Uh, this is a clear win for Silent, as you can see. Unless your workload performs significantly better than the other profiles, I really don't see a reason to deal with the temps or the noise. Okay, so this is synthetic, but what about gaming? And it's about the same. Uh, the other profiles are only 3% faster than Silent when averaging all of our results together and using Silent as the baseline. Uh, of course, battery takes a, an even larger hit here, seeing as the CPU and GPU are both uh, absolutely kneecapped at 15 watts and 40 watts respectively. Uh, incredible results actually for the Silent profile and really highlights the diminishing returns on the CPU architecture beyond 30 watts for, for this gaming setup. Okay, uh, let's take a minute to talk about who actually made this review possible. We got our review unit from HID Evolution. If you don't know who they are, they're a laptop retailer with a wide selection of gaming laptops across most manufacturers. If you take a look at their website, you can see just how much customization they offer when you're ordering a laptop. This means if you're not a do-it-yourself, throw warranty to the wind kind of person, uh, you can have your device customized and upgraded before you even unbox it. Plus, they're a great team to interact with. Uh, check them out when you get a chance. Uh, we'll have links in the description below. We walked away from this device with a clear recommendation. Use silent mode. The instances where additional power headroom was actually beneficial were few and far between. Even then, it wasn't a large gap in performance. In silent mode, this device is very quiet while performing better than most of last year's larger, thicker, and louder laptops. All this while maintaining great thermals. An impressive feat by MSI. Beyond silent mode, the laptop is solidly built with a slim profile. I found the keyboard to be great with solid tactile feedback, and the keys weren't all that loud. The audio system has improved over prior stealth devices that we've tested, which is also a welcome improvement. And the screen is a solid QHD IPS display with good response time. On the other side of the coin, there's some things that we would suggest MSI improve for the next go round. Battery performance is one of them. The performance on battery is just plain bad. I understand you can only use so many watts on battery power, but I would have liked to have seen smarter management because those Intel chips need the juice to perform. While the keyboard was good, it would have been nice to see them use the space a little bit better to provide a better arrangement for the 10 key and arrow key placement. Three of the device profiles also provided very similar performance, so it would have been nice to see some tweaking with them to provide more of a staged approach on the power limits between 30 and 100 watts. Also, it would have been nice to see more attention given to the webcam and mic. Given this device appears to be marketed as a hybrid work slash gaming device, if we had to pick an Achilles heel of this device, it's definitely the battery experience. There was no amount of tweaking we could do to get this device to last longer than two hours and 10 minutes during our video rundown test. This would be somewhat okay. I mean, this has high power components in it after all, but the performance itself also tanks. So it's a bit of a double whammy. Well, that about wraps it up. I appreciate you all for watching our review. We've got many more coming, so like and subscribe and, you know, all of the clicking of the bells and, and whatnot. Also check out the Owner Disown Discord community, which we have linked below, and we'll see you on the next one. Cheers.